Now this video is something of a long time coming and it's the, about the politicization of science that occurs on the left. Now I'm not trying to set up any sort of um, equivalency here it, when it happens on the right and it does much more frequently it's usually a much more egregious abuse of science for instance um, people who deny climate change or evolution these are very large concentrated efforts on the right and uh, it's a bit troubling but nonetheless when I'm watching say a popular internet news program which stirs up a bit of fear of sorts against a scientific or technological breakthrough through a, uh, a misunderstanding or sometimes no real evidence at all it bothers me and I think it should be pointed out regardless of political affiliation that you cannot simply or you should not simply slander science or technology or raise fears about it unless you have some sort of evidence to back it up and uh, I think one of those instances for instance <laughs> are uh, the case of GMOs. For those who don't know, a GMO is a genetically modified organism. That's basically taking the genetic information from one organism and implanting it into another. Uh, an example that I quite like is to take a bacteria that is resistant to pesticides and implanting the genes responsible for that into a crop, such as corn. And when you implant uh, that gene into the corn, you suddenly have corn that is resistant to a pesticide, which is neat and it's very cool, cutting edge technology. Well, it's about 20 years old, so it's not quite as cutting edge as it used to be. And a lot of the fears over GMOs, including very concentrated efforts to get GMOs labeled, particularly in, uh, there's a proposition in California right now to do that, stem from the notion that we don't know whether or not GMOs are dangerous to us because there haven't any, been any long-term studies. Of course, this notion that long-term studies will settle everything is a little bit new. I mean, I haven't quite been hearing it so much. I'll sort of <laughs> back off of that because perhaps I haven't been aware of every criticism of GMOs back into their introductions in 96 when I was a bit younger. But nonetheless, it's really the only ground for criticism of GMOs because short, on the short term, there is actually ample evidence that they're perfectly safe. 90-day trials are enforced on all GMOs uh, to show that they have uh, no negative health consequences. Uh, the FDA tests them. There are multiple studies that have looked at this. Um, they're free out there. But when I did want to point out to and look at one that I think is quite serious is uh, the one that was recently released uh, by some French scientists and had a rather nasty picture attached to them and uh, that picture looked like this. So that thing is totally gross and a very interesting image to look at but um, it's actually not the most important image in the study. The most important one is this one. Now here is the most important picture, the most important because it contains the actual results of the study. And uh, fair warning, the next few minutes are going to get a bit complex. And that's not because science is inherently complicated, it's because this study is rather convoluted. Now the way this design worked is that several rats were fed either genetically modified corn the corn plus a pesticide or the pesticide alone as well and there was also a control group you may have noticed I mentioned that the rats were fed a pesticide that's because the pesticide was diluted in some water and then the rats were given it to drink which is a bit strange because you don't ordinarily drink pesticide um, but that's how they decided to do their study anyway so the rats were split up into groups of male and female, and uh, depending on how much food they were being fed that had been GMO'd or had pesticide on it, uh, there would be three groups within that, one that had 11%, one that had 22%, and one that had 33%. You can see them in the graphs. Those are the thin, medium thickness, and thick lines on each graph. And the dotted lines are the control groups. Now there were only two control groups, one of 10 males and one of 10 females, compared to 90 rats who were under some sort of experimental condition. Now this is 
creates a bit of sort of a lopsided results. But the real problem is just that the sample sizes of each group were just too small to really have a strong prediction in this case. And if you notice something interesting within these graphs is that the amount of GMOs or GMOs plus Roundup or just the Roundup itself, it doesn't really predict whether or not something will die early in the sense that having a lot of GMOs in your diet versus not having a lot doesn't really seem to have an effect. For instance, the top left graph of the males who have been fed GMOs, it's actually the group of males that were fed the least amount of GMOs in their diet at 11% of it that seemed to die the earliest. About half of them were dead before the cutoff point. Um, that cutoff point decided because that's the mean age of these rats, so that's why it's some of the graphs are kind of cut off. I didn't cut them off myself. This is just how they were presented in the paper. I would have liked the rest of the data for the female rats, but uh, this is what we've got. Anyway, so if you look at the, the GMO graph next to the male one in the top right, so for the females, you notice that those that were fed 11% GMOs were actually the most long-lived. Um, so uh, what does this mean? That women can have GMOs and men can't? or And why does having fewer GMOs have no effect, or a greater effect, I should say, than having a lot of GMOs in your diet? Clearly this study was designed to show that increased dosage will have some sort of effect, and these numbers just don't really say that at all. Now, uh, let's take a break from this picture and move on to something else. Now these, well, cute to some, sprague zulu rats are the ones that were used in this experiment. And one of the findings of this experiment is that these rats developed several tumors. I mean, tumors seem to be rampant among them. And that, I mean, it sounds strange on the face of it, except for the fact that these rats actually develop tumors quite regularly. In fact, uh, there are several studies that will show you that somewhere around 50 to 60 percent of rats will develop tumors if they're live, allowed to live a normal and healthy life. In fact, tumor growth will be exacerbated if they're allowed to eat as much as they want. This species of rat is particularly prone to tumor development, and it's a bit strange that this type of rat would be chosen at all. This is Professor Gilles Eric Serrani from France, and he was the one who conducted this study. And uh, I'm showing a picture of him now because he's the very first scientist that I've ever, in any paper I've read actually, who included a special section to note that he was not under any conflict of interest during this study. This is the first time I've ever read that in a scientific paper. Now maybe I just haven't been reading enough of them, that's entirely possible. I think what's more likely is the fact that he's trying to at least intimate that other papers written about GMOs are under some sort of bias, that they're being funded by a chemical company such as Monsanto, and the results are not to be trusted, at least not to be trusted as his are to be trusted. The only problem with this, of course, is that he himself takes some money from Greenpeace, which has kind of chosen a side on this GMO debate a bit prematurely. They think they're bad. And he also has published several books about GMOs and the possible dangers of them. So to say that propagating the notion that GMOs are dangerous has no profit incentive for him is, at least on the face of it, not too easy to believe and go along with. But I should note that just because someone can profit some from something doesn't necessarily mean that their scientific work should be discredited. It's just as true for him as it is for true for scientists working and receiving some funding from Monsanto or some other chemical company. What's important is that we look at the scientific work they've done and judge it on its merits. That's the easiest way to discredit a study to discredit a study is to look at it and find fault with it. <laughs>
Now, I still have a load of questions for this study. For instance, was it a double blind? Or did experimenter bias potentially have a role here? How much food was fed to these rats? As we know, too much food could lead to an inordinate number of tumors forming. And perhaps most importantly, what mechanism are they proposing by which GMOs could have a negative effect on these rats, or humans for that matter? They do mention glyphosate, uh, the active ingredient in a pesticide, could possibly affect the liver and lead to several tumors forming. The only problem is glyphosate's been tested even longer than GMOs have, and at the levels it's being used on pest in pesticides is far too low to have an effect on a human liver at least. But no real mechanism for how GMOs might have a negative effect on human beings is even proposed. And ultimately this is my problem with people who bring up this menacing specter of long-term GMO threats. What exactly is it about a GMO that poses a threat to us? It should be noted that GMOs can do all sorts of things. You could genetically modify something to be poisonous, but you would have to modify it for that specific reason. See, when you modify something's genes, it's not an imprecise science. They aren't just slamming genes together and seeing what happens. They're inserting it very carefully, and carefully to the point where there is very little effect on anything or the surrounding genes. I mean, if you inserted a gene into something and it altered the entire DNA structure of an organism, it wouldn't grow properly. It would just get very messed up. That's why this form of genetic engineering has to be very precise, very careful. And if you need to be reassured about this, I suggest you read what some scientists have written who have been working in the GMO field and what they've been doing. <laughs> if you've seen some of what their work is like, you'll begin to appreciate some of the efforts they put into it. Now some of you are probably really pissed off, probably saying things like, wow, some of these companies like Monsanto, they like they sue farmers and they have these deceptive contracts and they use monocropping to cripple developing nations and to be honest I agree with all of that I think companies like Monsanto are incredibly deceptive and their business practices are often very terrible for everyone but Monsanto but does this mean GMOs en masse are dangerous I think this is an important point that a lot of people miss. Just because a company is doing some bad shit doesn't necessarily mean that the technology they're using is inherently bad. And it's a point that seems to be lost on a lot of people. So about GMO labeling, uh, I'm pretty cool with that actually. I think transparency in our food is a good thing and I'd be curious to see what sort of genetic modifications are going on if the labels are that specific and I hope they would be <laughs> otherwise they'd be kind of useless but the problem with that labeling is that I don't think most people are like me in that I think most people would probably freak out if they saw that GMO label and I think that's what the chemical companies are worried about that's why they're fighting the proposition so hard and they don't want to lose those profits and you can say, you know, let the public decide. Just let them be informed and figure things out on their own. It's like, that would be good if there weren't certain media outlets very, very frequently suggesting not just the Young Turks, but uh, in particular the Huffington Post bothers me quite a bit with this. And that is posting things that suggest GMOs will have a negative long-term effect on our health, even though the evidence for that is at best, spurious. Now to wrap this up really quickly, a lot of alarmist tactics are used on GMOs and their supposed long-term negative health effects, including going so far to say is a study, the one I just highlighted for instance, but there are a lot of other ones out there that could be mentioned are lifted to a level of prominence that they don't really deserve and instead of actually engaging with the science people are more comfortable in just saying 
this confirms my preconceived notion that GMOs are bad. Never mind the fact that no one ever explains why a GMO would be bad for your health, aside from the fact that it uses science that someone might not be familiar with. I think it's important to look at a body of work, not a singular study, and try to be a little more skeptical of things that confirm your own fears. Because ultimately, when you let your fears dictate what you see as valid or invalid science, you'll be letting ideology guide you rather than the evidence.